been a quiet day. Morning broke over Jerusalem like it usually does in the spring of the year. Nice, and cool, and beautiful. There were people already gathered. It wasn't too early. They'd come together for the feast. They'd come from many different places. They had come there for the, pe the feast of Pentecost. There were old friends getting back together again, and there were people who were coming together who were making new friends. But there was a certain excitement in the air because the last time they had a major feast here was the Passover. And some strange things had happened at the Passover. They remembered it because they had been a part of it. They remembered lining the streets. They remember hearing the cries, and they had participated in the cries. Crucify him. Crucify him. They lined the streets and walked along with him as he made his way down the Via del Rosa. He made his way to the cross. They, they saw the, the cross being handed off to another person to carry because he kept stumbling. They took him to the cross and, and they waited outside and they watched. They watched as they put nails in his hands. Nails on his feet, placed the, the cross in the spot and dropped him in. They were there. They remembered. And Matthew and Mark say that when Jesus died, he uttered a loud cry. A cry that tore through eternity. And they could hear that cry. They could hear the things that he said. So today, they were expectant. They were talking with one another and wondering what was going to happen. What was going to take place at this? For they had heard rumors. They had heard, heard signs that, that, that Jesus actually came back to life. Some of them claimed they had actually seen him. Wonder what is going to happen here. Maybe it was something in the air from out of the heavens, Acts tells us, that came down like a mighty rushing wind. But something caused excitement among the people and they began to run and to head after it. Yes, yes, there were ambulance chasers even in those days. As they went and chased after the sound to find out where is this coming from? What is happening? What is going on? They were able to hear the sound. They were able to see the sight. And then the apostles were told that they began to speak. And so they began to do. They came from heaven and heard the sound that was there and the things that were happening. Then they gathered together and they came, and when they came to the place where it all originated from, they found a man, a man by the name of Peter, who got up and he spoke and he addressed the crowd. He began to talk to the crowd about, about things that were happening. There were, there were many people who had gathered, who had come to hear this, to find out what was going on. What was this with a sense of expectancy? There were many thousand people who had crowded into the area to be able to be there and to hear what this man had to say. They had come from all over the place. They were from many different nations, all over the known world at that time. They had come there for the celebration, for the feast. They were Jews. They were people who knew about God's word. They were people who had heard about the things that were happening. But they began to mock with one another. and They began to say, what is going on here? They weren't quite sure, so they came up with their own solution. They began to say, these guys must just be drunk. They're full of a new wine. Nah. Now, I've known some people who were drunk. I've never known anybody who was drunk who did better at something than when they were sober. It doesn't make sense to me what this was. And so Peter addressed them. The first thing he does is everybody's staying there because all this is happening. They don't know what's going on. And so they begin to cling and they begin to ask questions and they're wondering and they're thinking. First thing Peter does is to answer their question. And he tells to them, no, these people are not drunk like you think they are. They're not drunk. It's only nine in the morning. Now, today that might not be a good excuse, but for them, they took it as it was. No, he says, instead, this is what the prophet Joel had said. The prophet Joel said, oops, there it is. The prophet Joel had said, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your men will see visions. The old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire 
and bellows of smoke. The sun will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He was talking to Jews. He was talking to people who had grown up with these scriptures. The Jewish child from the time he was little had to begin memorizing scripture. And he knew what Joel was talking about. He'd read it. He was familiar with that. And now you're telling us that what is happening here and now is because of the, the prophecy? They could believe the prophecy. They believed it was from God's word. And to be able to relate that to it gave a special significance to it. And so here he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then Peter gets up and says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth. I remember that. I remember that guy. He's the one who was crucified. Yes, I was there. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. No, no, no. They told us that he was an insurrectionist, that he was against Jewish ways. He deserved to die. And then somebody next to you says, yeah, he healed my cousin. He gave sight to the blind. I was there. I saw it. He did many wonderful, miraculous things. And Peter continues, which God did among you through him. This man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Notice how many times Peter says, you. He's making it personal. You, you people who are here and who are watching, he was handed over to you. God knew it was going to happen. He was handed over to you. And you, there it is again, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. You killed him. You killed the one that God had sent. You, you personally, you individually, were the ones who killed Jesus of Nazareth. The one that God had sent to redeem you, and yet you killed him. But Peter didn't stop there. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, or no wonder, my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. Because you have not abandoned me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. This is the one that the scriptures had talked about. This is the one that you killed. And so David says, sorry. So David says, brothers, I can tell you confidently, I can tell you, listen to me, listen to me, that the patriarch David died, he was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. You know it. You know where it is, being faithful Jews. But he was a prophet. And because he was a prophet, he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead then, knowing what was to come, he, David, spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he, Jesus, was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. And we are witnesses to that fact. We know that it happened. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, he received them from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. The evidence of what you are seeing and hearing right now is because of what Jesus has done. For David did not ascend into the heavens, and he, but yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, the Jews have pondered over that for many centuries. What do you mean the Lord said to my Lord? And right here, Peter is showing him that Jesus is Lord. He's calling him God. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Enemies, enemies, a footstool for your feet. 
Who are the enemies? Wouldn't the enemy be the people who put Jesus to death? Wouldn't the enemy, wouldn't an enemy of yours be somebody who killed your only son? Would not they become an enemy? Would not the enemies then have been those people who were sitting there, standing there, excuse me, in the audience, listening to Peter's talk until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Who, who can stand up against God? Therefore, Peter says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. What? Let me get a grasp of this. That man, that man that we saw, who came down and we, we shouted out, crucified, that, that one that we saw on the cross who said, Father, that, that one was the Son of God? And I was a part of his, well, his execution, his murder? What possible thing can I do to make amends to God after killing his son? Are there enough sacrifices? Are there, are there enough animals in the world that I could sacrifice enough to make up for that? Are there enough incense that I can burn that I can go to God and make up for killing his son? Is there enough prayers that I can say, enough Hail Marys, or whatever it is you want to put in there? Is there anything that I can do to make up for killing God's Son? So the people exclaimed, what am I going to do? I saw him doing things. I saw him, I saw him evolve. I, I, I heard him. I heard him talk. I, I, I saw him heal. I, I heard him on the cross. I was evolved. I was a part of it. He's talking to the very people who had been there 50 days earlier that had crucified him. A wretched man that I am. What, what possible thing can ever save me from the wrath of God having killed his son? But Peter doesn't end there. He says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, what are we going to do? This was not a logical question. This was a cry of anguish. What are we going to do? What can we possibly do? But Peter responded to them, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. There is hope. There is hope in him. Because Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What? You're telling me I just killed God's son? That I just murdered the one sent from God and there is no amount of sacrifice, no amount of prayer, no amount of incense that I can offer on behalf of my iniquities and Peter you're telling me repent and be baptized oh, that, was, that was a cry of hope that was a cry of, of something that they could go into and so many people began to respond to it again you will receive the gift of the Spirit, the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for whom the Lord our God will call, with many other words. He began to plead with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Save yourself from this perverse, corrupt generation, the things that they are doing. He goes on and says that many people were baptized that day. That about 3,000 people were added to them, their number. Well, if, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you, if you, if you just learned from the text, the text scriptures that you believe were from God, you just learned that what was happening is, is, is the promise of God. You just learned that the promise of God in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as he calls him, the Lord of Lords, he calls him both Messiah and Christ, that one is one that I killed. Wouldn't you respond? Wouldn't you say, Lord, please, please, anything, God, anything you ask of me that I might be able to do that. And all it takes is repentance to change. All it takes is baptism. And my 
sins are washed away. How can that be? I don't understand that. We killed God's son. But God is a gracious God who is willing to give us hope. The rest of the chapter of Acts, I can sum up in just one word. What it has to do with this is being committed. Because you see, baptism is not the end of it. It was not the end of it for these people. It wasn't that they responded that day and day and they were baptized and then they said, okay, let's go back and do what we're supposed to do. No, Peter said you must repent and be baptized. He said that there is more to it than just getting wet. You must then be committed to God. And so they were. And many of them also faced death gladly because they did it for Jesus. They did it for Jesus. So the question comes to us. It's the same story. It's the same story. God. God sent forth his son. Born of a virgin. Born of the law. He sent forth his son. And we killed him. We really did. Just as much as those Jews there on Pentecost. Because it was for our sins that he died. He died for all of us. And there is nothing. Nothing can do to appease that iniquity. You can't pray enough. You can't give enough. You can't help out enough people. You can go to Africa and China and the North Pole and you still won't have done enough to make up for killing Jesus, the Son of the living God. There's nothing you can do except to follow the gracious God who says, repent and be baptized. And you and your children, and your children's children. For it was for them, and it is for us. And we will be forgiven of our sins. Oh, holy God, oh, merciful God, have mercy on us. We, today, have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. Thank you, God. Jesus saves. And he wants to save you. As Peter said, repent and be baptized. God saves. And you can be a part of that kingdom today. If you would like to be his, please let us know while we stand and sing together.